Hey. Here we go. <clears throat> Hi, welcome to another episode of the Blackout Tips Podcast. I'm your host, Rod. Joined as always by my co-host, Karen. And we're live on a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a nice day outside, but we're inside recording a podcast because that's what we do for a living. Mm-hmm. We also are not alone. Mm-mm. We have a guest, a first time guest on our show, mm-hmm. but I've heard of, I've heard him on other podcasts. Uh, including uh, Mike Kaplan's podcast, uh, including Keith and the Girls, where I first heard of this guy uh, when he was still going by the moniker MC Mr. Napkins. Today's guest is comedian, writer, rapper, and game show host of The Crossword Show, Zach Sherwin. What's going on, man? Hi, Rod. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. (laughs) I, uh, I had an internal clock going as to how soon Mike Kaplan's name would come up. So I'm glad we got it out of the way, out of the gate, just right in there. Oh, he's the best. Yeah, honestly. He I is the best. Like we, have to, we have to address the elephant in the room, which is that uh, Mike Kaplan uh, brings all the good people together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in the he Mike really Kaplan does. Universe, you know what I mean? <laughs> like all these, in the Mike Kaplan multiverse, all I feel like there's a lot of good people coming together because of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's like a whole multiverse that exists inside Mike's <laughs> brain. And I also like that he, um, that you called him like the elephant in the room because our friend, do you know Ramin Nazer? He's an incredibly talented artist, but he does a lot of like Mike's trippy, colorful artwork for his albums and specials mm-hmm. and stuff. And he has a book called Infinite Elephants. That's just a bunch of rainbow elephants with their... Oh trunks in the next elephant's tail like into infinity <laughs> like turtles all the way down so it all just is connecting together very nicely already so yeah How, how'd you meet mike mike and i met because we both went to brandeis university um in the outskirts of boston and we sort of yeah we met each other there we didn't really become close but then I started a comedy group with some friends on campus and we lived in boston for a while and did our thing um and when the group started breaking out and I started going solo. Mike just was like friendly and sort of older brotherish towards me. And then we're both vegans and like we're into words and Brandeis and we like music. So we had all these things. And a story that's like part of our friendship creation myth is that we were, uh, he called me one day out of the blue and we started talking. And at a certain point, I just realized, oh, he just wants to chat i thought he was calling me about something but i didn't have too many like other adult male friends who would just call me up to shoot the shit um that is weird right like um i don't know why that's such i don't know if it's a gender thing it feels like it is though right whereas like guys are very uh functional or something it's very transactionary like (laughs) oh i called you because i have a question about a carburetor and you're like oh and if we happen to branch into like how your family's doing that's cool but this was a purposeful call i had someone call me today and just chop it up with me for a few minutes and uh they called me about something and it was just a related idea and then we just ended up talking about shit for like 30 minutes i was like yeah, that's what friends are, I guess, right? But <laughs> you have an excuse as a guy. Yes, but I, you I have think to. Ha- you do. Sorry, Karen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think you do. And and what's so weird about me is when I call people, a lot of times I call them and I'm like, "Hey, how you doing?" And then my very next statement is, "I don't want anything." <laughs> I, I literally, like, like the next thing I say, I was like, "I want you to know if this conversation is two minutes or thirty minutes, I don't want anything. How are you doing? What's going on in your life?" And then we can move on from there. <laughs> well, I appreciate that because I like like when people take me for a walk someplace where I don't know where we're going. I like being told, okay, this is going to take about 15 minutes and then we'll be there. So I think it's nice <laughs> to set the expectation. It just yes. gets out ahead of the anxiety of uncertainty. And Rod, I feel like um, the way like, well, cis men often hug, mm-hmm. you have to do the like quick very staccato, like <laughs> clap each other on the back kind of thing. <laughs> everything with yeah. y'all is violent. Why? From from the way you smell, everything is brute punch, kick. You be like, <laughs> what? This, this is not an odor. This is an action. <laughs> this is a We're talking on the phone, but it's very yeah. cut and dry. There's an agenda um, item. Also, like, so you say you were in a comedy group at uh, Brandeis. Did so? Did you form this group, like? First of all, how does a comedy group come together? Is it like, you're funny, I'm funny, let's be funny together as a, as a business? 
I think so. Well, so we started because we were just like some creative friends who didn't really see a way through the various acapella groups. Though, don't get me wrong, I did belong to those, a as did oh. Mike, actually. That's another important <laughs> point. Uh, we both had the acapella connection. Well, now um, we have to have you on together and then two more people have a quartet. <laughs> <laughs> so our college was founded because Jews were getting excluded from um, like the college, like the college admissions process. And so they said, well, let's have a college that Jews won't have a problem going to. And so there's this non-exclusiveness principle behind Brandeis, which is great, but it shows up in like a couple strange ways. And one of them is that for groups on campus to access campus funding, each has to have its own unique mission statement. I'd have to do the math exactly of why, but like it, you, you, you can't be like competing with another group and there's like a better group that doesn't let some people in. So like each group has to be its own thing. So because we were like a liberal arts college in the Northeast, there were like 15 acapella groups on campus, but to plug into campus funds, each one had to have its own unique mission statement. So there was like one that was, there was like the co-ed one. There was the all male one. This was the, there was the all women one. There was the just Jewish music one. Um, each like 15 acapella groups, each like twisting itself into the most ridiculous pretzel shapes to have its like own <laughs> unique mission. And so Mike was in the all male one, which was called voicemail. Um, <laughs> of, course. Great name, of course and then mine was um the constraint of it was that all of the music came from before 1980 that was the particular mm -hmm. choice that my group made which is weird because i don't necessarily identify strongly with the music of the 70s and before but um that was where i wound up and i'm proud to say that while i was in the group we did do an arrangement of Rapper's Delight, which came out in 1979. So we like snuck it under the wire um, oh. and managed what to was get the that name of, What was the name of your group? It was called Company B. And we sang that song about the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy at literally every oh, performance wow. we did. Wow. We, it was like to get the campus money, we had to sing that song. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. <laughs> that, that's not real. <laughs> so that was your that was the, the the singing group. But what about the comedy group? Is these totally. two different groups? I got so excited about my story. So in my free time, <laughs> um, you know, I, I just had some friends, and one of them said, "Like, let's do something." And then the way that it wound up expressing itself was this comedy group. And so the guy who started things was named Is. He's still alive. Uh, his name is Andrew Slack, and he had a show on campus called, on like the campus TV station called Late Night Snack with Andrew Slack. And it was like on from mm -hmm. 1.30 to 2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the group called ourselves, because it was theatrical and there was Late Night Snack, we called ourselves the Late Night Players. And okay. it was okay on <laughs> campus because people had some context but then when we were like wow our sketch comedy shows are going great at the college where literally everybody in the audience knows us uh right. let's see if we can take it out into the real world and so we started touring on the college entertainment circuit which is like a multi-billion dollar non-profit industry where it's like i hear that it's a lot of money to be made out there yes mm -hmm. um Barely enough to feed like four to five, you know, 22 year olds. Um, but we like squeaked by a subsistence living for a little while on the college circuit mm -hmm. as the late night players. So it was a name we would sort of come to be like, I don't know if I want to be necessarily associated with this. People think it's some sort of, you know, live sex show. But um, <laughs> the, late, the late night players was it. We would get a lot of raised uh, eyebrows uh, did, when we'd did, say did, it. Did anybody come and ask y'all, like, were y'all doing midnight shows? Like, <laughs> like I'm doing 3 p.m. You confuse people. Because it was like, that's not that's not going along with the name. Yeah, oh. the, late night, the late night players sounds uh kind of cool actually yes like it, it sounds, sounds like ladies we're gonna be here yeah. after midnight. <laughs> like that could have that could have been one of the 70s groups that y'all covered <laughs> right. in your other your other group the like yes. the, ohio, <laughs> the ohio players the late night players <laughs> like i could have seen it coming man. Like, so what happens when That's you so realize that you have to go that you're gonna go solo because you said this before you went solo is it like every you know movie about a band it was it animosity was it cool 
You know how to go. Um, that's such a good question. You're such generous question askers. I guess it's good because you host a podcast, but I just want to pause it and <laughs> hit the hat. <laughs> um, okay, so we started like like pieces started chipping off of the group. We we actually mm -hmm. fired one guy. It was awful. Um, but oh, we just it God. just wasn't really working out. Not in any dramatic or interesting way. It just was like it, it, it's it fit. It just was, it was what we decided to do at the time. And we thought it was a good decision. And in retrospect, I'm like, we should have just let this great guy stay in our group. <laughs> what was wrong with us? It got a Lord of the Flies. <laughs> the power went to your head. It did. But, you know, we're still cool with that guy. We were all at his wedding. Um, wow. It was like embarrassing for us that we like, you know, some people were like, oh, from the comedy group, you know, his parents and stuff. Oh, so man. anyways, he so that guy, do, he should have made y'all do all the toast. You know, like, oh, y'all so, so fucking funny. Why don't you say something, Zach? Let me introduce you. Here's the guy who fired me from his comedy group. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the late night players. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, guys. Do a little. Y'all got it, guys. Do a little skit for them. <laughs> show them how funny. Show show them how fun. The, show them how great the comedy that you fired me for is. Yeah. Show, show them what I couldn't keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> so so you so then you fired okay, so one guy. We fired him. Then another guy left. Um, mm. the aforementioned Andrew Slack, who actually left because he started this nonprofit organization called the Harry Potter Alliance that was based around the like enormous and pre JK Rowling being a turf, like years mm. and years and years ahead of that. It was basically like, if you love Harry Potter, and there's so many of you who do, and you think right. it's messed up that like the elves have to do like enforced labor well that's like actually a problem in the real world so let's use your passion for that in the books to translate it into like an actual social justice thing and so wow. that's, smart. that's cool it was cool so he wanted us to do that for a while and we were like no yeah. and he was like <laughs> okay then i'm leaving um yeah, that's the thing that you you have to be into if you're not into it you're like the fuck is happening well is i mean on? if you're the kind of person that fires people for not being funny enough you're not going to stop <laughs> Doing your your comedy to go to charity. Like, yes, come on, man. We That's have not decided we that this is the road. It's not why we got in this game. Bro. Comedy a bust. This is the late night players. I mean, the I mean? name speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh and the God. other thing, uh, I'm gonna let you get right back to it. But the other thing too is, um, I just missed the Harry Potter fandom because I'm just too old, just a little bit too old, like. Mm. Just like like I like I like I'm Power Rangers, but not Pokemon. Like I'm just a like you know like where you're just a like two years, years too old. old. Yeah, and so I'm just a little too old to be like huge into Harry Potter. But I recognize so many people are, mm -hmm. and I always felt it really sucked that J.K. Rowling turned out that way because yes. they had one of the best non toxic fan bases. Like low key, they still do. Yeah, because like that fan base was willing to be like. Well then, fuck her. And yes, I was like, <laughs> fuck her, but 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 I am still going to support. Like, and and, and the thing is, it's so much money out there because my niece, uh, she is y'all. This girl probably read thousands of books within her lifetime, and because she's a heavy reader, so I was like, well, what's one thing that you haven't read? Because everything I offer her, I read Hunger Games, I read this, I read that. I was like, shit, I can't find her anything. So then we got to Harry Potter, so I bought her the uh, Harry Potter set and she's just in love with them. She absolutely mm -hmm. loves it. So it's like one of those things where people have went down from generation to generation. And I, I'm not gonna lie. I just saw the movies, y'all. Please don't shoot me. I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm okay. There's a lot of movies. people that just saw the movies. But <laughs> yes. I, I think that the thing is like, as a fan base and then as like the morals of those books, it seems so anti the stuff she's taking a stance mm -hmm. on. And so it's just really a shame because like what other... I can't think of another nerd franchise that would inspire someone to be like, I'm gonna start a 501c. We're gonna help people in the real world. Like, <laughs> like, have you met Star Wars fans? They're just they're just they're like, they're like fighting because it's like uh is this a black person on the screen? I don't like this. Yeah, and the, and the Harry Potter fans is like, look, 
we're gonna get a sweating hat to determine which social group you're gonna be in, and, yeah. and we're gonna throw <laughs> tails up and then and, and, and stop us. It's like and which one of our group, burns. like which one of our houses is gonna raise the most money and stuff. Yes. So like, it's, it's really it's just I don't know. It just made me mourn the loss of of J.K. Rowling's uh weird like what her weirdness did damage to that fanhood because that was so fucked up. But yeah, uh, my bad. Back it's, to back no. To it's, can I say something about it? It's such a bizarre oh, carve out. Like I still, I understand that it's like my naivete as not a member of the trans community to not understand how widespread transphobia can be, but it's still like the woman who made it a point to say Dumbledore was gay can't like bridge yeah. the rest of the daylight. It's like you're one inch away from putting this bridge together. It's such a weird thing. She, um, when it they did, when they did the, the play, like the Harry right. Potter live, she made sure to cast Hermione as a black woman and then wrote about it and was like, yeah, on purpose. She should have been black in the book. That's what Muggle is all about. Fuck y'all. And I'm like, wow, what an impressive thing. Also, trans women aren't women. Like, oh, no. Oh, no. no. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, don't, don't do it. Don't oh. do it. Yeah, like I said, I, and I started reading the books. I need to get back into it. But I know if I was to join something like that, I am House Hufflepuff. Whatever Hufflepuff doing, you know what we're going to do? <laughs> Hufflepuff is going to bake cakes. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're we going to feed everybody. I, our, our fundraiser is going to be like, let's let's see who can sleep the most. And, you know, you, you ever <laughs> sleep the most, raise the most money. You know how to be like, you can run 5Ks and we give you, you know, uh, so much dollar per 5K. It's going to be like, we give you so much dollars per hour you sleep. Come on, House Hufflepuff. We, you know, you can do activism in different ways. You, everything ain't got to be all, all active and shit. We'll be holding out a water for you at the uh, refreshment station as you run by on yeah. the 5K. That, that's yeah. not, that's in Activision, actually. That's the opposite of Activision. <laughs> the, the money goes to the same cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to do a, like a physical report. I'm in my, like, insulated closet with, like, mattress foam up on the walls, which is hot. And L.A. is, like, starting to get hot today where I am. And oh, you're man. making me laugh. And talking about us firing that guy in my comedy group. I have, like, five different kinds of sweat happening on my shirt right now. It's really good <laughs> that, the, that the front of it is, like, off camera. Well, you're glistening, okay? Yes. I, don't, don't I know. It's good. very clear on the forehead. Yeah, it's don't worry. It's 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 a good thing. Okay, don't don't even don't even the um the thirst traps are happening right now. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. Totally. Yes. The, My the own beer thirst is the for thing. being dehydrated. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's good. I like being able to, I like being made to laugh so hard that like, you know, you cry or sweat or like, those are, yeah. those are good laughs. Your stomach hurts, the body, the yes. body knows. So, yeah. okay. So we fired the first guy, the second guy left to go, you know, save, t like cancel sweatshops. And so yeah. then it was like three of us. And one day mm -hmm. we went on like a little, like, you know, I think we all knew, but we went on like a breakup like creative retreat but we all sort of understood what was going to happen and we were trying to write some sketch or other it was just three of us we were like a shell of what we once were and one of us just said we're done right it was basically like that and the other two were just instantly like yeah let's stop doing this <laughs> and so we had a few <laughs> we had a we've had enough you've had enough <laughs> yeah like let's not this horse is so dead it's like a horse skeleton at this point there's nothing to beat it just we're just like crumbling these bones into finer and finer dust um so we had a few college contracts left on the books. We ran them out. And then by that point, so I had started, I had started writing like comedy raps for lack of a better word, because that's exactly the word for them. And so right. at, what I started doing was like, I would write these very silly raps and I would do one of them per show at our college shows. And so the first stuff I wrote, I would have like an open mic to test it out of. Like the rest of the group would be like, yeah, fine. And then Zach will take three minutes of that college hour we're contracted to do and like do a rap or two. And so I was writing these raps and I was performing them for college kids. And it was like a weird way to back sort of like back into having spots early on with the new material I was working on. So when the group ended, 
I likened it at the time to just like getting off a subway train on the platform and then the next train arrives and you just like step one over into the next train and then you keep going on that. So I was doing comedy spots in Boston. Mike was befriending me. I was like meeting people in the scene around there. And instantly I was like, this has more to it than what the group was doing. Like we were mm -hmm. good friends, but we were never going to like turn this into a thing we did for like, you know, many, 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 many years. Right. And then the other thing I was like, this seems to be getting better responses than what I was doing. And so that was like the MC Mr. Napkins phase. So how did you start writing comedy raps? Like, was it, because it sounds like you were, it was kind of like a bridge where you were already kind of writing them and then the group ends and you're like, oh, I'll just lean more into it. So like, uh, was it something you've been doing from like an early age? Was it something you started in college? Like, what was the impetus for the start that? Yeah, so I, um, I bet we're about the same age, Rod, because I also feel like I'm just a little bit too old for Harry Potter. Um, what yeah, did you I'm, say? I'm, I'm 40, so I'm 43, but I'll be 44 in September. Okay, and I'm turning 42 in about three weeks. Yeah, that's so, about it, right? Like, somewhere around there, like, my brother's 40. He turned 40 yesterday. Uh, happy birthday, Rod. Happy birthday. And, um, happy birthday, baby. He, like, he was, like, Pokemon and Power Rangers, and then I was like literally like a summer from being like, like that would have been my shit one summer before that. And then just something about that summer, I was like, this is kind of corny, right? <laughs> 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 Let's go outside and do some things. Let's uh, try to talk to some girls or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I really identify with Power Rangers, not Pokemon. I'm in that exact same age yeah. bracket too. Yeah, I don't know how that happened because I, I mean, Power. I, the first couple of seasons of Power Rangers is my shit, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. apparently they have 37 seasons now. They do it in different and, versions and yeah. universes. Yeah, and I couldn't keep up, but like my brother, I'm sure knows all that stuff. And Pokemon, I remember literally telling, turning to my brother while we were watching it. And uh, it was doing that thing where it's like, who's that Pokemon? And you, mm -hmm. said, it's like a silhouette, and then yes. you're supposed to name it. And I, I looked, was always wrong. I looked at him and I just went, this is just selling toys. Of course. <laughs> it, it, it repeats its name so that you can harass yeah. the shit out of your parents. But but I don't, well, I guess the joke to me is like, I don't know why I made that distinction. All of it is just selling toys. Like mm -hmm. everything I loved as a kid was literally just like Transformers, buy the toy. G.I. Joe, buy the toy. Mm -hmm. And then for some fucking reason that day, I was like, this is selling us toys. We should stop watching this. <laughs> totally. You had the key epiphany of capitalism. The clouds yes. parted. <laughs> Though I do feel like, okay, like those movie, like Pirates of the Caribbean, um, you know, a movie based on a ride. Like at least maybe yeah. with Power Rangers, there was some like narrative ip before the action figure oh, tie-in sure. came in for or is sure. that not true i would be unsurprised to learn oh, that that's oh, not sometimes true sometimes it's not true well yeah. well so power rangers is a lot like um transformers and yeah some of the stuff we grew up with some of that stuff didn't even originate here it's like japanese mm -hmm. and then the the english audio that we know it as isn't even the original stuff they were talking about so oh, it's just yeah. like some American people were like, uh, this is also true with a lot of Kung Fu movies. Oh, Like some American people were like, we're going to, this is cool enough to sell to these kids. I don't know. Just fucking make them say something when their mouth moves. <laughs> yeah, that's why it was always off and you would be like, I don't think they're speaking English. And none of the shows <laughs> typically line up narratively. Like mm -hmm. each episode might as well just start over on a new one. And I tried rewatching Transformers season one when uh, the Blu-rays dropped i bought the like a collection i was like bad. i remember this it was so good and um, i think i got two episodes in same thing like, with gi joe uh, not it was mm. bad well, mm. and not even bad in a funny way it was just bad so, so but anyway can i ask a transformers related yeah. question do you remember yeah. there was sort of like a there was like a universe throw off transformer things like earned go bots there was like they were sort of like lower uh caliber yeah. transformers but then yeah go bots suck yeah because roger's mama used to get him to go bots go bots like, i'm not paying the, the 49.99 <laughs> for transformers you're gonna get these two for five go bots yeah go bots is what my mom got me from family dollars to shut it was like up. it's the same thing mama, right. it ain't. Like, yeah. they don't right. even transform mama no they do the arms don't bend right by the way there's a um as transformers is to go bots there is a harry potter analog named charlie bone 
He's like no a, way. He's the GoBots. Of, yeah. So Not Charlie Bloom. Holy um, shit, that's terrible. <laughs> right? That's a horrible name. <laughs> <laughs> they even so, have books. Like, right? like <laughs> Charlie Bone just like rip off a of Harry Potter with no like no they don't have any lore or anything. Right. You know what Charlie Bone sound like he would be on one of them CSI series. I'm Charlie Bone. I go solve the crimes. Right. What do you do? I go dig up the bones. It's in my name, Charlie Bones. Right. Like, Sir. <laughs> okay, so but then there was something that I remember from my childhood called Rock Lords, and it was Transformers, but they turned into rocks. And then yes, they would unturn I into, that. Yeah. I looking back, I uh it sort of boggles the mind. Yeah, I also say, do you have a picture of that baby? I can pull some up. Yeah, okay. but also same thing, similar thing, like no TV show or anything. It's just it's just mm -hmm. a ripoff. Like mm -hmm. there was also a toy, and I forget the name of um these toys, but they were like American guy dolls or something. And they were like so uh, American those. soldiers or something like that. Yes, yes, yeah, ripoff of GI Joe. It was so clearly a ripoff of GI Joe. Oh. Even on the packaging on the back, it would say like stats and stuff like GI Joe had and everything. Oh, that toy looks terrible. Yes. Wow, Rod, yeah, you're kind of blowing weird. my mind right now with nostalgia. I remember there was one named Nugget. He was like a gold. <laughs> Nugget. Yeah, how many names could there possibly be for <laughs> you can't get too creative? I mean, with rock lords, it has to be like granite. Yeah, slime stone. Yeah, slime stone. You can't have it so many names. Marble. Yeah. <laughs> Countertop. I mean, the name makes sense. <laughs> Countertop. But yeah, and then oh I don't remember. God. I can't remember the the other doll, the it, but it was like an American soldier. <laughs> Mm. action figure or something and it was just so pathetic i just remember mm. being like oh this this sucks these aren't gi joes and they weren't um they weren't as uh what do they call it where they can move their arms reticulated oh yeah right? articulated right yeah, yeah articulated. so they didn't have as many points of articulation <clears> as <throat> the gi joe so like their arm would move like this oh so gi joe, <laughs> gi joe had like a wrist thing <laughs> And they, <laughs> and also, for That's some hilarious. for some reason, their the holes so they had no elbows. The holes in their arm <laughs> that allowed them to uh, hold weapons. Oh yeah, were just a little bit too small to hold GI Joe weapons. You could like squeeze them in, but they pop out like after a few seconds. Um, mm. It was just such a weird ripoff, and my mom bought me those because uh, she was like, GI Joe's cost more. God. <laughs> yeah. More That's than so I'm willing to pay for you to tear up in less than 10 minutes. So you're, you're so how did the rap start? I'm sorry. Right, 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 right. <laughs> we yeah. all off topic, baby. This is, what <laughs> we, this is what we do. I know. I feel like that's it. Um, that's the thing. Uh, it's a sign of a healthy conversation. Lots of digressions. So <laughs> my first, um, the first rap tapes I got for Hanukkah in 1991 were, um, Naughty by Nature's self-titled debut and yes. uh, Peaceful Journey by Heavy D and the Boys. And oh, um, go, Heavy D. Yeah, R.I.P. Uh, so I, um, yeah, I had been into. I got into rap like like um, untold numbers of little white Jewish kids around that time, um, <laughs> and it started being on MTV, and then we were all exposed to it, and we got so into it. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of grew up where like my friends and I would like fuck around and write raps as a joke when we were teenagers. It was just like a, you know, like a goof around thing that we did together. But <clears throat> I remember, and I say this with, I am laughing, I am making fun of myself, but I thought mm -hmm. I'm better at this than everybody else is in my friend group. Like the little yeah. raps that I make up, like, I think they're kind of good in a way, though, mm -hmm. You know, they definitely weren't great in lots and lots of ways, in in almost right. all ways. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I sort of saw what I was doing. And so I kind of stuck with it. I had this experience in college where I went to a Naughty by Nature concert. They had at Tufts in Boston. They had just put out the album that had Jamboree on it. So they were touring with mm. that song. And um, they, they were like, hey, uh, like every stop we go, every show we do, we like to like bring up local performers. So like Tufts, if there's anybody here who raps and you want to come on stage, like go ahead and come on up. 
and they were like the first rap group I'd ever been into. And so my friend, my friend put my arm up in the air and they were like, yeah, kid rock. I remember Tretch said, come on up. <laughs> and so I went up and um, I rapped with them and it went really well. When I was a sophomore wow. in college, like KG Yay. was like dropping the beats out for my punchlines and stuff. And so it land with like a big, you know, it was just exhilarating. I'm like, I can oh. feel my, uh, like hormones and stuff like body chemicals yeah. kicking in as i talk about it i'm like super adrenalized so oh. yeah so i just kind of stuck with it and then in my 20s i'd been like doing sketch comedy which was like communicating one comedic idea and then elaborating on it in a space of like two to three minutes four tops and then you're out and so i just feel like no intention i didn't expect for it to happen but after a while, I was like, I had sort of always just kind of messed around with writing rap lyrics when the idea would occur to me. And eventually, I was like, oh, these two things can be married together into because that's like about the length of a song. Like a sketch is a non-musical comedy song or a comedy song is a musical sketch and you're just doing the lyrics. So that's the that for me is kind of like the through line to like being a fan and then trying to write but not really have having any scaffolding or a structure or a platform for how the raps were gonna it was just like random assortments of couplets about what a great rapper i was and so then i started figuring out like okay i can do and then those early raps it's really i actually find it really embarrassing to look back on like i'm not one of those artists who's like it's all been good all along i don't know who is mike might be right i think <laughs> mike has self consciousness about it but mike, yeah mike is probably um so well balanced and not as insecure so he's able to look at it and be like even if it wasn't good he's like but i thought it was good at the time mm -hmm. and that that is good and mm -hmm. that's what led me to be good now or something and now 10 years from now i might look back and think this isn't as good but yes because his brain works like a computer yeah he's able to process all that i mm -hmm. also have a secondhand embarrassment for all everything old that i've that i've written and I, I i have stuff around here that's old that i've written and yeah stuff you have written to me i have all <laughs> the letters that you wrote me in college yeah and i have a bunch of like wow. raps and poems i wrote uh in school and stuff because mm -hmm. uh the, for me i used to write um not not humble brag but i was smarter than the classes i was in so mm -hmm. i would write during the class i'd just be like oh i'm gonna write some raps and then just fill up notebook after notebook of just, you know, ramblings and verses and stuff. And so I kept a lot of it. I don't have all of it, but once I was done writing it, I was done with it. Like, like, I, was like, like I look at that shit now, I'm like, Jesus Christ, these are horrible. What was I, what was I thinking? Why did I, why did I want to do that, you know? <laughs> Got that out of my system. Let's move yeah. on. <laughs> well, I did. I tried to rap. Like I did mm -hmm. it for a little bit when I was like twenty something. Yes, even me and my brother to Detroit and and yeah, we went to Detroit. We did people even the knew the songs and stuff. Wow, yeah, like, like my friends and stuff liked it. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like like people like we would sell like a mixtape for five dollars or something because we weren't trying to really make any money. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we just it was like a hobby. Like what a fun thing we're doing. But uh, I didn't care enough to want to be good at it because I just thought it was so hard for people and random for people to be good, you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, and then I had a friend who, no offense to him, was not as good at rap as me and my mm -hmm. brother, but he did want to make a career out of it. And he was pouring so, so much, much money. money into it. Woo, he spent so much money. And that was like, again. Yeah, yeah. And that was a deterrent for me because I was like, Oh, it cost a little bit of money just to record what we did, and that was fine. But like to try to pay someone to play it on the radio during the mm. noon hour, that feels a little like too much. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> and it sounds like it was a hustle. Like they was like, yeah. "Oh, you got money," and they was just trying to hustle him. Yeah, out yeah, yeah. There's a million ways to get hustled music wise. Mm. Um, but what's interesting though is if it was comedy, as opposed to like because we made like serious not not that serious but we made like serious yeah, rap he, you would yeah. he wouldn't live in his raps some yeah. of them some of them were funny mm -hmm. but i i think comedy rap there's probably less of a predatory nature right because right. it seems like the people that they really want to like screw you over uh are the people they think have some type of uh wide stream appeal <laughs> in a certain mass. lane of hip-hop yeah. i just it, i just wonder if like comedy wise if they're like oh he's doing jokes and comedy the super duper predators might not 
like coming that lane? How, how, how's your experience been? Oh, I mean, I have so much to say about it. And also my experiences at the time were like, my recollections are obscured by like a fog of obliviousness. Like I was just like, <laughs> people like when I rap. So here I go. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a really like very carefully considered like career switcheroo. Like I feel super lucky that it has worked out and that I continued to like introspect about my relationship to what it meant to be like a guy using raps to make jokes and like trying to triangulate as to like where I was going to be comfortable with that. But at the beginning, I was just like, you know, one of my early um, like bangers in the Cambridge alt comedy scene where like, let me say, I knew just by virtue of ever having listened to rap, like I was the people I was performing for were all like people who lived in Cambridge and were coming to stand up comedy shows. So like just by virtue of having ever listened to rap, I I knew more about it than 99 percent of them. And they were like willing to take my word that this was rap. Um, right. But so like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think this is the hip hop thing the kids are doing. Oh, okay. <laughs> this seems like an approachable, accessible way for me to listen to this. This, mm -hmm. this like, doesn't seem so bad. You know, it's like, like the yeah. end of uh, Back to the Future where a guy's calling. <laughs> uh... <laughs> That's dope, though. God. So, yeah. So, like, you know, a lot of the premises of that early stuff was like, like the first song that I felt like you know, people like would comment to me about was a song called um, Sphygmo Manometer, which you probably know is the name for like the blood pressure cuff that they test you with at the doctor, like the Velcro one that they pump up. And so yeah. the rap was just about all about, it was like a song about what an unlikely name that was and how strange and silly it sounded. And so that was like what all those raps were. Um, just like the th common thesis was like, who would ever write a rap about this? But this nerdy Jewish guy seems slightly better at rapping than we expected. So um, I guess let's put it all together. And that's a comedy act. I also so, appreciate the charity of you saying that we would know what that is. Because I definitely did not know the name <laughs> of that. I was like, that oh, that's what, they, that's what they call the arm cuff? Yeah. That's what I call it. That's new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Sweet. it was really important for the success of that song that most people didn't know that that's what they were called. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that would be terrible if you like did that rap to like a medical group or something. They were yeah, like, yeah, right. It was right. like we know. Yeah, no shit. And right. <laughs> yeah. So that's that was on my. I mean, so I got to put out a record with Comedy Central Records, and Sphygmo Manometer is definitely on there. It's under my. It's under MC Mr. Napkin. So. You know, it's out there for people to listen to. It's good. Like, it's sort of embarrassing, but there's good things about it. Let me put it that now, way. Is like, a comedy record deal, like, is it as predatory? Do you feel like, you know, signing the Suge Knight and Death Row where you're like, oh, God, I hope they don't hold me over a balcony <laughs> or some shit. Hope I, hope I see some money from this one day. Well, I think the difference between the scale at which I was signing record deals and that at which Suge Knight was signing people to record deals was like, there was a lot of daylight between those two. Um, <laughs> like what part of show business we were uh, operating well, I in. I mean, you got in after the comedy East Coast, West Coast beef. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd have been all right. It was after Sam Kennison and Chris Farley died. So, uh, <laughs> great choice, before. Rod. That was a great choice. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'll say this, like, I never saw, like, it didn't, you know, it didn't really change my fortunes in any direction. Um, it was nice at that point when I hadn't really done anything else to be able to, like, attach Comedy Central to my name. Though also in comedy, a lot of times you get introduced when you don't have any credits as he's been on Comedy Central. <laughs> People just make it up to so the crowd. Yeah. Oh, damn. It's just like the go-to, like, yeah, probably they'll throw they would people will believe that they would throw this crappy act on government. right <laughs> they're um, like people aren't going to verify this yeah right 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 exactly the internet sleuths so um it, that was nice but i will say like it kind of sucks like there's still administrative mm. stuff to this day that i have to like deal with because it's like you know an 80 dollar check you it's i i'm not at the point where i'm not like yeah i mean i'd like 80 dollars off of music i made oh, yeah. over a decade yeah. ago sure mm -hmm. why not um right. 
So, you know, it is like, it's been a little squirrely along the way, I will say, or it's just been a hassle. And so I don't say that to complain as much as like, I can imagine that if you're talking about real numbers and real money and these kinds of like misunderstandings and lack of clarity are happening, like mm -hmm. I can see it being the kind of thing that you would sue somebody over if it were like a hundred or a thousand or a million times bigger than it is for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, it's just interesting because I, uh, uh, I do understand that because we've had that kind of stuff happen with the show where it's like sometimes it's good to just be associated with something, even if it doesn't technically make you a lot of money or doing Correct. like your life's kind of the same. But people are like, wait, HBO is right. doing something with you. And that means a lot to them. <laughs> so, yes. so I was like, sure, I'll do it because it means a lot to y'all. Uh, but technically i just want you to know i was dope before this and <laughs> <laughs> independent of you hbo you didn't yeah, end like, up. it's like no they made you rock i appreciate y'all <laughs> recognizing that i was dope but that's how this thing works is that they normally don't message you until after you've already kind of established that you're good right um so then with um with with the like comedy rap is there any such thing as like the comedy rap beef or is there comedy rap like behind the scenes stuff in like it is in the rap game? I wish I, I, I mean, you could go through a list of comedy rappers, you know, we could all mm -hmm. spew some names out. I know we I don't want to get you in no trouble. Okay. I know Weird yeah. Al likes to like come after people. <laughs> that guy <laughs> is aggressive. Don't don't, <laughs> do not believe the way he always <laughs> seems nice at every possible opportunity. <laughs> that guy is a monster on and off stage. <laughs> He's a sociopath. Um, <laughs> I never had anything like rap beef with people. Um, mm. I it, it just I think I was like it would be most appropriate to think of me as like a stand up comic who had a weird act. Like uh, I just I felt so much like I was part of the comedy scene and so. Do you ever little, feel like, like people? You ever feel like people are poses though? Because there's also people that like make one comedy rap you know what i mean mm, or they like they do mm. it for like you know like a week and then they're out of the game and you're like oh that's not that's not you're not really one of us mm -hmm. yep or i would do um i like this let's get in there let's name names i know <laughs> but would musical comedy shows which whew, i don't know who's like yeah I need a I need a whole show of all musical comedy, but <laughs> they they apparently exist because I've done those shows to not empty houses, and man, you would definitely see people who are like, I want to try my hand at this rap at this comedy rap stuff, and man, it is it's hard it's hard to sit through, and plus there are some basic rules that you um like if someone said to me like how do I get started in comedy music first I would say like. If you, you, you need to have this vision so clearly that you don't need to ask me any questions because my advice to you is find a different path. But yeah. <laughs> one rule is you can't repeat your choruses in a comedy song. You have to change that chorus every time it comes around. And so by the time, the third time you sit through a chorus about like, just change the lyric that it ends on or something, you know, to keep right. it interested. But, um, you know, the third time you sit through the same course about like somebody's camel toe or something, it's just you question all your life decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the thing too is um a lot of times with the comedy music route, it does seem to help the people that have like a background in music. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah, I mean? I, I don't that. think it's necessary mm hundred -hmm. percent, but like there's like an extra level. Like um, so you can be on beat. Like when I watch uh Bo Burnham's uh special on Netflix, and you're just like, this motherfucker could have been a musician, musician. Right, right. He just went into this other lane of of I want to make it. I want to make fun, poignant stuff. Same thing with rap, where you like you listen to somebody you're like this person could have just rapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. but on the top of that, like I think that's like as a floor, it needs to be like you could have just done this thing, as opposed to like. Listen, I'm bad at this, but I'm funny. It's like, well, I don't want to see that. Mm -mm. <laughs> right. No, I no. I had one idea that could be a rap, and so I chose to express <laughs> it as a rap. Um, <laughs> yeah, and like, that's not like me. No, I'm not good at it. And I don't <laughs> pretend because I am horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, I won't lie. I would feel really, I, it, it would feel great to me when people would be like, after shows, they would be like, hey, like, you're, you can rap. 
I mean, like the compliment would feel fantastic, but I really think that for me, it was like rapping was the way I was going to do comedy because I wasn't a stand up, but I had these ideas and I didn't want to do sketch. So like, I don't know specifically that it was rap. That was just the music that I listened to. As it turned out, I like, I really like lyrics. Like yeah, it just is like a, I, I don't know. It has proved, I'm not exactly sure why, but it has proved to be like a really uh, fruitful way for me to get ideas out. Yeah, uh, for sure. I guess I, what I mean is more like some people think the joke is being bad at it. It's yes, like, yes, 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 yes. Uh, like that, that, that has a very short shelf life. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, because after a while, because people, that, the requirement yeah. is going to go up. They're going to like, you eventually, you need to actually be good. Yeah, at after, this. after a while, I'm just listening to bad rap. So, I, most people, that's not a thing they want to do. So, mm -hmm. uh, there has to be a baseline of like, yeah, like you said, it's, um, it's a compliment, but it's also like, kind of like, to me, the underlying skill of it, uh, which is, oh, no, you can rap. And then you say interesting, funny shit I want to hear, which mm -hmm. is, Basically, what rap is, right? Well, good rap. Um, so you have your your you're rapping uh, uh, by yourself. You've gone solo. You left the late night players behind. Yes. How do you get into the epic rap battle? Um, uh, yes. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I moved to LA um, to pursue show business dreams, and um, oh, yeah. I was rapping out here and. It was going okay. I was meeting people. That was good. Doing spots was good. Um, and where'd you come to? Where'd you come from before? Boston to yeah, LA? Yeah, I lived in Boston. I skipped New okay. York. It's the comedy oh, rap, but okay, I, okay. I didn't go to New York. Which, which scene was better for the comedy rap game? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very specific game. I want to know but... about these streets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god now it's discomfort sweat again i you know i just <clears throat> it's so like whatever i i felt um boston i was like okay i'm like outgrowing my aquarium it's time for me to move mm -hmm. to like a bigger place and then i got to la and i was like whoa it's way bigger mm -hmm. here than i thought it was going to be um, mm. so, but, you know, I was finding my way, I was meeting people and being in the places that you should be. And then, um, I had met Lloyd Alquist, who's one of the two, uh, creators of Epic Rap Battles of History, um, which if people don't know is like, a uh, in its, in its lane, a massively popular YouTube series. And so, yeah, I, like if, if no one's like, they, they also have the albums and stuff on, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Spotify stuff. Um, I've watched the videos. Um, and um, it's it's so dope. Like I like honestly, is like it was one of the first things that I remember like nerding out on on, on the internet where mm. I was like, oh man, this internet it's got something to it. <laughs> got some good stuff. Y'all been on the YouTube's? It got some good stuff over there. I think this is gonna really thrive. Yeah, yes. um, <laughs> one day this is gonna be really big, guys. Listen <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so Lloyd and I, you know, when I came to LA and was like reaching out for friends to anyone I'd ever met who I knew lived out here, Lloyd was really, you know, he's a very his name sounds like the word loyal, and like yeah. to my ear, that's like you know, there's some meaning there. He's like loyal Lloyd, so he was like, Yeah, come around, do spots at the theater I'm managing. And so then we were just in each other's lives again after like meeting maybe 10 years earlier at some comedy festival on the East Coast. We just kind of stayed in touch over the years. We toured on the college circuit. He also was like active there with his group, his improv group. So we had like some, we stayed in touch. So then I moved to LA. He was kind of like, hey, we're starting this thing. We might have some sort of writer position available. And then I feel like between that conversation and when I actually came on, the series sort of took off. They had a, mm -hmm. they did Darth Vader versus Adolf Hitler, and it really yes. went like it got banned in Europe, which is always a great sign. And uh, <laughs> they, um, you, know you made it. Yeah, that's right. So you know, yeah. So then they were like, okay, we got to start making a lot of these videos. We're gonna need writers, and so they brought me on, and that know, was in 2011. You know why it got banned in Europe? I think um, Adolf Hitler and Holocaust material is like mm. pretty still sensitive, as it, wow. which I don't dispute. I mean, oh, that yeah, sensitivity yeah. is warranted. Think, I'm just trying to think of like how vicious the bars had to be. 
for them to be like, <laughs> yeah. yo, that's too much. Like, Mm-mm. this is too much. Like, Hitler's spitting too much sauce right now. <laughs> this is going too hard. This motherfucker's <laughs> about to bring the movement back <laughs> with these jokes. We got to cut nope, this shit got out. to go. Oh, too, no. many, too many skinheads on the train being like, oh, what you listen to? <laughs> you, listen, you, <laughs> you listen to that hot fire, that new Hitler? <laughs> like, no, sir, no. <laughs> new oh, Hitler, no. new Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> no shit, no new shit, shit, new shit. Remember when like DJ just leave that phone numbers on the mixtape? Yes, five, 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 yeah. three, seven. two, seven. It'd be like nine, nine, nine. You know. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hitler rap is bad. You do have to ban it. It's you know, yes, yes. I, I would agree. You're but no. but I do. Rem- that was the first epic battle that I saw. And that was the one that that did make me be like, "This is great!" Mm-hmm. Like these people are really good at rapping. I I did not want to join uh, any causes. I didn't join the Darth Darth Vader and the Sith, and I didn't join Hitler and the Nazis. But I just thought that the concept was so dope, you know. Yeah, well, and I think they were trying to do like what we were sort of speaking to earlier, where it was like, "It's going to be well produced." The um it's actually going to be historically accurate. It's going to be funny and like outlandish. And then sneakily, like we're also going to try and rap as like, we actually are going to bring some craft to like the rapping piece of it. And so I think that was kind of their formula. Yeah. And so you start writing for them. Mm -hmm. So does that mean when you, so how's the writing process for that? Like I've written now for one TV show. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Congrats. <laughs> so That's I, great. I know what it's like. Okay. Um, <laughs> but what's the writing process for like rap? You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, is it a collaborative thing? Are they just assigning something to you? Or are they like people that portray the character have to write the rap? Like, how does that work? Well, as you might imagine, so now it's been like 12, I'm in my 12th year of still writing for the series. And it's been, you know, there have been peaks and ebbs and flows and how much was coming out, but it's, it stayed relatively consistent. Like I bet every year of my career since 2011, I've like done paid work for ERB. So, and so as you also might imagine, the process has changed a lot over time and depending on what's going on, it can look different, but I would say the classic answer to your question is that they would give us the, you know, they, they hand down the matchups. Sometimes I'm brought into those discussions, but when they're like mapping out a season, they'll be like, okay, we know we're going to end with this big event. We're going to do this along the way. We're going to do this. So they hand out the matchups and then it's like, okay, now we're writing on, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so then I'll send in a script full of lyrics, just uh, sometimes even just like a, a Google doc, or I'll like throw together like a super quick demo over some beat that they send just so they can hear where I'm hearing the jokes landing and stuff like that. And then they'll kind of take, they'll cannibalize that and take the stuff that they want and chop it up and rearrange it and rewrite it. And um, and then, but, so that's one way it can go. Like if I'm touring or something and they need some scripts, then like that's how I'll submit remotely. But the best way it goes is when it's the slowest way, but it's so fun to be like all three of us in the room and someone will throw out a thing. And then it just like gets like thrown in the middle and like everybody like, spins it around like pizza dough and we're tossing it to each other and like so that's really fun that's the kind of like group collaborative mind that you you know it's like right. the best version of it i think yeah that's interesting because rap like there's a cadence to it. i mean there's a cadence to all humor anyway right mm. um and i know when we were writing stuff there's a way it happens in your head there's a way it happens in the room and then there's a way it happens with an audience um, yes they're not all the same <laughs> right the, i i agree with that so strongly but i've never articulated it or heard it articulated before that's so true <laughs> so like uh with music how how instrumental are you in because it like with cadence stuff right like you can send a uh, bar to somebody and they can be like, we're going to encompass it, but but if it, your bar is in a different type of rhythm or a different type of vibe, it, are there, you know, is, is it stuff where they then manipulate it to get it in or they send that it back to you right, or, yeah. or is it just, oh, my shit didn't make it this time. Oh, well, oh, you know. Do you punch up too sometimes? Like they were like, make this funnier? Mm. Uh, yes. Oh my God. I want to reiterate what I said before about generous questions. Um, You ask them. <laughs> Uh, so (laughs) for example, I I would be totally comfortable saying this in front of Lloyd. I have like a very 
pack in as many syllables as you can squeeze in the internal rhymes whenever possible like make this make it for syllable nerds that that feels to me like where i want to go with raps right. lloyd one of the two guys in the series he's like a blue collar rapper he's like just like mm -hmm. let's just bang the jokes in like as steadily as we can um mm -hmm. and really like land big body blows and i just feel like over the years we've been like i will write lyrics that are to my specs and then he'll take it and just be like well this is i see the concept I see the words that need to rhyme. I get what the essential joke is and I'm throwing out a lot or all, or maybe just some of the like right. flippity dippity, like ornamentation yeah. that you put on here. And like, that's fine. That's a totally fine way for it yeah. to go. But um, it does always feel like all, oh, even though it's probably just a little bit, it always does feel like all oh, when they send it back. Like, yeah, well, so the version we decided to go, you're like, oh, so what you're trying to say? Like, totally <laughs> and so and then when you do get it in i always uh, feel like i got away with a caper like i'm like same. i can't believe they took that <laughs> same i feel like there's this one joke that uh there's a couple of jokes we had for uh game theory which is the show that i write for um and it's like a sports show um but there's this one joke i pitched that was so bad that was how it was funny and i i knew it when i uh pitched it <laughs> And the room like grown laughed and I was like, so, all right. I just had to get that out. Sorry, everyone. They were like, and uh, Bomani, the host was like, no, we should do that. I think I can sell that. We should. And I'm like, like, it really felt like shoplifting or something. <laughs> like, I, yeah. like, I just wanted to like exit the room. Like my job is done here. Bye everyone. <laughs> uh, and it, it made the show. I, um, I wrote some songs for the TV show, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, which had so much music in it and it was so cool and one song i wrote was it was about like a rap battle of niceness and so it was two characters like out Aww. you know one upping each other for who could be nicer but it was actually very aggressive um there was a adorable. lot of there was like confrontation behind the niceness so they were like trying to top each other's compliment and so i wrote this lyric lyric for it and i said I was looking up synonyms for rap battle uh, mm -hmm. on thesaurus.com, one of the lyric writer's great friends, along with rhymezone.com. And uh, <laughs> it was like scrimmage was one of the th the synonyms for battle. And so I wrote a lyric that was like, um, this is, so it was a compliment battle. And so I was like, this is a cheer scrimmage, like cheering for someone, mm, yeah. a cheer scrimmage, like a rap battle, but the mirror image. And I submitted it and I was like, there's never, that's never going to make it in. <laughs> go and then it did. And I was like, oh no, somebody should have pulled the pump the brakes on this. You're like, but, you should have uh, me. <laughs> I thought there we was call those, some oversight. Heat, we call it a uh, heat check. Uh, <laughs> heat check. Our job, where it's like, like, and sometimes they catch them and they're like, all right, that's a good joke for a Friday. Cause <laughs> like we got two more days and we can't say what you just wrote. Cause it's two something. But uh, every once in a while you do you do a heat check and it makes it through and it kills and you're like all right we got we were cooking with something and right. yeah so and uh also <laughs> the other thing i'll say is like your job is to shoot you know you're you're yeah. the you're like the shooting guard on a basketball team your job isn't to make the decisions it's just if we give you the ball shoot so if they if you wrote something and they go yeah that's good we can make that work that's that's how your job was you know even I think if that's you right. thought it wasn't the best one that's right you play to the top of your skill and you have to you know battle through imposter syndrome and say i'm here because they wanted me and my brain came up with this so like yes let's go yeah they called me off the bench so it's time to get out here and perform <laughs> that's huge it's huge but that is so it's so true man um so all right when do you get comfortable in that role as a writer and at what time do you start like performing? Because you're also, you portrayed several mm -hmm. characters mm -hmm. in the epic rap battles. Is it all at the same time? Like you just come on and you're already like, boom, I'm ready to do this. Or is it like uh, you had to get comfortable doing it? Yeah. Um, well, for maybe, I mean, I perhaps the two of you can relate to this, but my every, every um, like pursuit or endeavor that I've pursued, there's like a period of complete and utter where you're like, I think this would be good to try. I'm probably okay at it. And you're like clueless about your skill level. Your self-awareness oh, is yeah. nil because of your experience. And then some time goes by and you have that thing. Maybe it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect where you like 
start to realize how little you know about the thing mm. you you no yeah. longer yeah you like know just enough to know that you don't know shit and then yeah. it starts to get to a point where you're like you know somewhere on the spectrum of like I, I mastered this is maybe like, uh, I don't know if I've gotten there with anything yet, but like yeah. some amount of like, okay, I'm avoiding some of the big mistakes. I'm able right. to do some of the things that I would like to be doing. I can make choices now. It's like a little more informed. So right. with performing with Epic Rap Battles, they asked me to be, um, the first role that I ever played was um, Albert Einstein battling Stephen Hawking. Um, Who your college was almost named after. That's right. Wow, Rod. I do research. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Hard hitting facts. <laughs> they, they asked him to be the president and he was like, no, I'm a science guy. Um, not the science guy. That would be yeah. later. But, that would uh, be Bill Nye. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. so yeah, I did Einstein and, you know, I think it was probably the first acting I'd like ever done. And I just turned everything up as far as I could and screamed at the camera and that was that. And so I just did um, my 11th battle, I think for the series, I played John Wick and that was fun. I like watched all the movies and like spent a lot of time trying to talk like him and imitate him. And um, it's not a perfect impression, but definitely it's the most I've ever like brought to a character in the series. So, um, you know, you just start, if you, if how you fuck does, up enough times and they let you keep going, you can figure it out. Like, how long does the process take for you to, cause like you've been there for almost 11 years and mm -hmm. done 11 battles. Is it a long process to do a battle? Like do you, is it a year long, uh, <laughs> that you have to get into these characters? No. Um, uh, it's always, and cause I'm only one part of the production right. machine. So like, I'm just at the writing phase. Um, mm. So there's all this, there's like a whole music phase where they make the songs and then there's the whole shooting phase and then there's the whole post phase. So it's really mm. like a big, uh, it's a big machine, but you know, shoot day, like we shot John Wick, I was in and out in one day, obviously they're trying oh. to maximize efficiency on, on set. Um, yeah. And then, uh, well, I mean, it's probably a f from starting to write a battle I don't know. I, I'm I'm sorry. I don't have a more sound okay. answer for this, That's but okay. yeah. I, I, it can I, I take wanna... weeks. It can take months. Okay. What is your rap stance like? Do you have like a position that you stand in, or is like do you kind of embody whoever you're performing? Mm. Like you know, how, how does that mean, go? Yeah. How much Zach is in Einstein and John Wick? Yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I think Karen's asking me like how I stand when I rap. Is that, <laughs> am I understanding your question right? You know, rap stance, because you know how yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. You're, you're when people come, they have like, they have an aura or like yes. a presentation of themselves. So do you come on like swing your arms? Or do you come right. on like embodying a character? Right. I remember once seeing someone imitate most deaf's rap hand like that. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, everybody's got their own style. Um, yep. uh, that's a good question. Um, it's making me think I should think more about my body language when I'm on stage. Um, I just sort of show up and try and stand like I think the character would. But mm. in terms of when I myself rap, um, maybe that's something I should watch some some game tape. Yeah, they, like Drake got a different thing. He do yeah, his hand every time people he People have like their thing, almost like yeah. their signature move, mm -hmm. like to kind of warm up. And, and like, that's the thing. Uh, so I guess the stance and the warm up will kind of be two different things, but how do you warm up? How do you prepare? Do you, you know, some people say I have to be quiet. Some people zone out. Some people listen to music. Like, how do you get your mind prepared to be like, I'm going to kill this shit? Mm -hmm. um, I find that pre-show time, like the half hour, 45 minutes before a show is excruciating. So I really like to have something to do. Um, mm. I don't, the thought of just like sitting there quietly sounds like, um, actually it's making me think that I should like lean into the discomfort and like try meditating quietly for 10 minutes before mm. show. But, um, I like to be like busy and distracted. Um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, I'll do anything. I'll tidy. I like to tidy. So I'll like clean up a backstage and make sure my stuff is all nice and orderly for after a show. Do you talk, do you talk to people or, or are you like, nah, I'm going to just sit in my green room or whatever. Yeah, by yourself. That sounds better. Mm-hmm. Sitting alone in the green room sounds better. I bet I'm pretty bad company. Just leave me alone mm -hmm. and let me meet in the room. Yeah. I, um. Do you have to audition for the character? Like, is it like, here's our list of people we want to do this year. 
did they already have y'all oh. in mind? Were they like, oh, mm. Zach could be this guy, or is it like maybe three people want to be John Wick and they have to say who has the best, right? Who we think would be best. Okay, so my answers there were about my personal performances, about being nervous and needing to tidy and that kind of thing. In terms of shooting ERB, man, I don't know. Like, I find it very unstressful. It's a really supportive environment, and I don't identify hard as an actor. So I'm like, I just, I don't have that much I can do here. Let me just give them what I got, and they'll be able to, like, I really, there's no world in which I am a master here. So hopefully I'll be, like, right by accident. Um, but, uh, no, usually when I play a role, they like have it in mind. And sometimes I played, um, a lot of times they give me like bookish nerds. So I've played like Albert Einstein. I have played Stephen King. I played, um, Egon Spangler from the Ghostbusters. I played, <laughs> I played Doc Brown from back to the future, who is like an Albert Einstein takeoff. So like, yeah. <laughs> I'm so typecast that they type, they cast if, me if as you, a guy. If you keep this up, you're going to get to play Rick from Rick and Morty. Let's go. <laughs> I should pitch it and see if we can get it on yes. like a heat yes. check. See if I can I mean, that's, that's like it. Albert, yes. Albert Einstein, Doc Brown, Rick. That's that's like, that's your lane. Your trilogy. You're right. <laughs> so, and, and even John Wick, I got cast because I have the beard. They were like, oh, that's yeah. what Keanu Reeves' beard looks like. But so the only time they've gone against type, there's an ERB where I play, I play Wayne Gretzky, a blonde <laughs> athlete. Do you, now, are you a sports guy? Do you know about stuff about Wayne Gretzky? Or is it just like, listen, these are the bars they wrote. I, this is my the Wikipedia tale. page. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> Oh man! Shout out to Pro Star. Speaking of nineteen uh, eighties uh, nostalgia, I remember that cartoon. A cartoon mm -hmm. with Wayne Gretzky, Bo Jackson, and I think Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. oh, um, wow. Yeah, I remember that. I used the, to watch that. The thing I like to think of now is what would the who would the Pro Stars be now, right? Because that was the eighties, right? It was hockey, baseball, and basketball. It'd be Tom Brady, LeBron James. And hmm, I want to go off the board and say Serena Williams or someone yes, like great. I actually think you go, oh, yeah, I okay. like because I'm, I'm on one. the same page with you. I think that the, the iconic people now, mm -hmm. the living legends, are those three, like, yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. but, like, uh, like the top, like on the top of their sports. Yes, who does your makeup for Guys, you? You, you put that to bed. I was, I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to have anything to add here. And I just watched you execute perfectly. Yeah. I, my other guess is that they probably had to expand it to more than three. But if oh, it yeah. had to be three, three, I think those are the three. Mm -hmm. um, who's, who does costume and makeup for, for like when you're John Wick or Einstein? Are you responsible for that? Or they have like a, people come in and do it? Albert Einstein is unmade. Oh, no, that's not true. Uh, there was a different makeup person at the time. It's been a succession of people over the years. And um uh, here's what I have to say about this that is more interesting than who the makeup person is, except to say that they have really qualified, like really, really good makeup people they work with. Um, when I did play Doc Brown, there was like a multi-hour bald cap process. Um, and it was really like you hear stories about actors like needing to get there at 3 a.m. to get in the makeup before they shoot, you know, for like mm -hmm. an alien role. Yeah, Th That was serious. And there were two days of shooting. And um gross detail trigger warning for those of you who aren't into bodily fluids though not the worst one at the end of the day when they would take it off because it's hot under the lights yeah. and it was so glued on that like an actual like quantity of sweat would like flop uh, out of it like it was oh, really really oh, serious okay because oh. just the heat there's there's no there's yeah. nothing for it to escape yeah. It can't evaporate. It's just sealed under a bulb cap <laughs> for like eight hours. It was uh, disgusting. After, after you do that, like you can never watch Star Wars the same way. Like when you when they're like Christian uh, uh, Hadison, I think that's his name, but he's coming back to play Darth Vader, and then you see the first shot oh. of him is him in the tube, and he's got the horrible scars and disfigurement, and you're like, that must have just been like ten hours of just, sitting in a yeah. chair. Yes. For that four seconds of screen time. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, man. By contrast, when I played Egon Spangler, um, another bespectacled Jew, they really just put a pair of prop glasses on me and were like, you're good to go. Just stand around till uh, 
It was like that Bobby. It was like the Bobby Brown song. They put a proton pack on your back and they split. (laughs) (laughs) It was easy. (laughs) They're like, we're going to go work on the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man for seven hours. So you just hang out and meeting up your green room, man. (laughs) Um, So writing for TV, because you said you wrote for uh, my crazy Um, Mm -hmm. ex-girlfriend. Do they come to you specifically for the songs or is, have you also written like narrative stuff or would you, or is that something you wouldn't even want to be interested in? It's like, I I would like to just do a song and and y'all call me when you need a song. Yeah, for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I would, uh, Rachel Bloom, the creator and star and I were friends from like the musical comedy scene in LA. Um, And she's, uh, you know, I I have uh, infinite compliments for Rachel and what she accomplished. She's awesome. So she was like, I I remember um, when she got the show, she was just, I said, congrats on your show, dude. The next time I saw her out and before it had started and she was like, I'm going to bring you in when we need raps. And she was really true to her word. And so they would just, I was not a staff writer and I wasn't writing scripts, narrative stuff. Mm -hmm. I would just, they'd they'd come to me with a song concept and, um, you know, I think they were so under the gun and they were being so ambitious with how many songs they were putting in per episode that they were just like, uh, it, as much as you can try and give us finished stuff. Like we're not, mm-hmm. it's not going to be us sitting with you and like working on it. Like, please, please deliver finished product as much as possible. So right. yeah, she would, she would come to me with a concept, a few key jokes that needed to go in. And then I would like fill in the rest of it. That was awesome. That was so I, I don't know. I'm like, st- I know it's like the internet and old fashioned TV is like passe and a different time, yeah. but like seeing that stuff get turned into TV was thrilling. Um, also, yeah. like, I like old fashioned TV, and truth be told, on the low, people are forcing people to go back to old fashioned TV. I know a lot of people get angry, but this is why people drop them episodically now versus mm. here's everything all at once. Mm-hmm. Because it's like one of those things for them. Okay, we we spent a year and a half. We blew our load on it. Here's everything. You fly through it, and then nobody else talks about it. But if right. people realize things that trend are the things that are weekly and, and, and also the things that are short. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So... Uh, is is narrative something you would want to do or or not? Nah? Sure. Um, I I would be interested in doing it. It would be another new thing to start doing and trying. Mm-hmm. Um, and like um, it's not something I'm specifically pursuing. And those jobs are so coveted that yeah. like if one ever comes to me automatically, of course I would be interested in trying it and doing right. it. Um, you know, it's interesting too because like I, 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 your rap influences, Naughty by Nature and Heavy D and stuff. I heard you kind of talk about them. Or do you have comedic rap influences or comedic music influences as well? Or is it just rap? Well, um, of course, Weird Al, of course, of course, of oh, course. Yeah. He's so influential um, and just teaches you. So he's like listening to his music is like learning a lot about how other people see things and what funniness mm-hmm. can be. He's just like, yeah, look. This is funny. This is funny. Here's my list of 10 things that are funny. Even the fact that like lasagna is like burping is like lint. You're like, oh yeah, these are all of a piece. Like, thank you for showing Mm -hmm. me this concept, Weird Al, that you can have like a set of key of like, yeah, key images. But so, um, or concepts. And then I think um, more than comedic rap influences, which not really over the years, I I only, and this is still true. The rappers that I really like and the rap that I listened to, a lot of it was people who had like a mischievousness to them and Mm. like also were super verbal because that Mm. works like jokes. So like, you know, I I didn't discover MF Doom till I was an adult, but like, Mm -hmm. I'm one of the people who's like, yeah, that guy, you know, in many ways was the best ever to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. And just hyper verbal, like uh, I loved like, you know, like for instance, I just I'm thinking of how punchliney Lil Wayne is. Like it's constant. Mm-hmm. It might as well be comedy. You know, like it, he's yeah. making jokes nonstop and puns and wordplay stuff. So yeah. um he's I was like older by the time I got to him and I wasn't in that key formative like adolescent, like right. really like it becomes part of your DNA phase by the time I got into Lil Wayne. But like he comes to mind in terms of like the sort of it, it is in some ways comedy rap, even though he's not doing it to be comedy right. rap. It feels like to me it's suffused with comedy. Well, time and, time and, and comedy and rap are very similar. Like, mm-hmm. uh, 
and some of my favorite rappers happen to also be so clever and clever and funny are so closely correlated. Yes, this is a better um, this is better put than I'm the concept that I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, like for me, I know uh, Eminem. I like just to me one of the greatest of all time. I I I I know it's of a time and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but um, like the other day I saw someone put up a Mount Rushmore of like the greatest rappers of the 2010s or something, and it was uh, Lil Wayne. Jay Z, Kanye, and Eminem, and people were trying to argue about Eminem. I was like, "Y'all are out your fucking mind." <laughs> in 2010, nah, he was running shit. <laughs> you should, like everything that motherfucker did was like gold was, at the time. Yes, he was. was rapping about pop stars and making diss tracks to pop stars, and people were like, "That I love this." Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. he was on another level, but um, Common, who when he used to go by Common Sense, was another one that. Super clever, very a whole lot of punchlines, and uh, funny. And then um, there was a time where like Rockus Records was coming up, and they and this one I was in like college area age, and they just had a uh, they had lyricists lounge and lyric they had like a TV show based off okay. of it, but mm -hmm. it was all really clever rappers. Most Def was with them, um, Talib Kweli was with them, Punchline and Wordsworth. All these people were there that were like, "Oh, they're they're good. They're really good rappers, but they're also so clever and funny." Yeah. Um, but it's just, it, um, and then for just comedy music people, uh, once again, they came later. They would be later than your formative years. But uh, Flight of the Concords was just that's my oh, yeah. shit. That was just like they were next level. I was yes, like, I, yeah. me, me and Roderick, uh, we pick at each other all the time. We uh, quote the song, you know. I always mm -hmm. go, it's business time. Yeah, yeah. We, I, yeah. <laughs> I listen. I, I listen to music unironically. Like, it's, right? Yeah. It, it, like, it's oh, about. it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Yeah, beautiful music. Um, I like that song. Uh, if that's what you're into, that comes yes. in my head I, constantly. It's so fucking yes. catchy. Yes. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yes, that's my jam. I like that. Uh. I mean, first of all, I love them. All. I really love every song, but there, there's one that was like stuck out to me as like, oh, these guys are good. It was uh, the the one about you're so beautiful, you could be a waitress. Yeah, you could be a, like, yeah, yeah. like you're the most beautiful girl in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. It was just like, oh, these guys are really good. They were like, mm -hmm. um, yes, part time the, model. Yeah, part time model. Yeah, that's my. They're favorite. like they're they're um like their ratio or like the density of like everything every one of those songs is just like the definitive yeah. word on that topic yeah. drop the mic you said what needed to be said you covered it like they and they, yeah. they do that thing that you brought up earlier where they don't really repeat the chorus mm -hmm. like each chorus is slightly different than than the first chorus like um i never even noticed that till you brought it up right um so what kind of nerd stuff are you into just in life are you into any of that stuff are you like it, when you portray Darth Vader, is it like because I also like Star Wars? Are you like that's I'm not into that shit. Um, I don't fuck with the theory of relativity. That that's Let got me, nothing to do with this. Fuck the theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we were created 5,500 years ago by an old white guy with a beard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I um, I think the way that my my nerdery has manifested as an adult is like in word stuff. And so um, I'm about, I'm like going on four, I'm like three and a half years into this crossword show project that I've been working on lately. And so I was not a crossword puzzle nerd and actually still don't think I am. I really think I'm like a lyrics and word nerd. Um, and so yeah, crossword puzzles to, are- Did you go to college for words? I wrote that down. Cause I didn't know a better way to phrase that question, but I figured you'd know what I meant. <laughs> I should have, I didn't, but I should have. I have a political what science degree. For? I have a political Politi science degree. Oh. I mean, which is kind of, it's kind of school for, it's kind of words. I, guess. I mean, I've seen it's these a lot of words. I've seen these politicians. It's yeah, nice. that's right. Okay, it's it's an it. important skill. Although it's less important to be able to, to have the, yeah. job, I think than it used to be, but. That is true. Um, One side is really, really yeah. good with words, and the other side is like, we're good because we're bad at words. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust, don't trust people who can word. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Well, so so I was just tweeting wordplay stuff and um a crossword puzzle maker named Will Nettiger, who is like, it turns out a prominent crossword dude reached out and was like, let's, uh, you know, I write crossword puzzles, you tweet wordplay stuff all the time. Um, let's figure out a way to collaborate. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I viewed it with annoyance at first, um, which I like to think was my gut sensing deep down that I was like about to undertake like a big new project and it was going to be a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. But I wrote back to Will and was like, okay, sure. I've never had anyone suggest anything this to me, like this to me before. What if you make a crossword grid and I'll write the clues, but we'll make them rhyme. And so they'll work like rap lyrics and we could like mm -hmm. make a song of it or something like that. And it would be like a crossword puzzle that has a song. And he was like, yeah, actually that sounds like a good idea. Let's try it. And so we wrote a puzzle and from there it kind of took off. And I realized that it could be a comedy show if we did comedy about um, each of the words that went into the grid and if, if, if it was like comedians solving it, like a panel of guest comedians Ooh. solving it. So that's how the show works. So like, you know, um, I like I just was working on something in one of our puzzles that happens to have the word Staten in the grid, like Staten Island. Ooh. And so I do some comedy about the Wu-Tang Clan um, who are from Staten Island. So that's kind of how the show works. Um, and that has proved to be like where the word dorkery, that's like where my nerd shit comes out. I really yeah. am into wordplay. Um, and learning more about the ways people can go deep with it. There's a whole community, as you won't be surprised to learn, of like crossword people and word people. And um, it's it's satisfying to me. Yeah, I like I being know, in I it. Know, I know they have a field day because it's one of those things where you can get as nerdy as you want to. And you can also be as casual as you want to. Yeah. And nobody actually feels left out. Like it's going to be kind of enjoyment for everybody. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of the one thing about that yeah uh this is a cute jerk uh cute joke trigger warning uh shout out to mike kaplan i bet there's not a lot of cross words in the cross words community ah, right. yeah. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this, this will be mike's favorite episode now i was charmed right yes, elephant in the room he always going to go show up <laughs> elephant in the room <laughs> it's funny because it's funny because Mike is like diminutive. He's not a big guy, but he does mm -hmm. like bring a lot of presence to any room he's in. So it's like a funny way to be an elephant for like a small Absolutely. person. This is a um, very, very tiny elephant. He's a tiny elephant. <laughs> um, so a couple things. One, everybody who I've met in the crossword world is like really um, smart and and sensitive and engaged and like cares about stuff um and like is on the right side of things uh as far as i'm concerned yeah. and like there's been a lot of criticism lately of the um fact that like the new york times which is like the most prominent crossword puzzle in the united states and maybe the world mm -hmm. is like was for a while run exclusively by like older white guys and so that has changed to some extent and like mm -hmm. Um, at the at the USA Today puzzle, which used to be like not a particularly exciting or well-run puzzle, um, they replaced the editorship, and now it's this guy named Eric Agard, who's like universally viewed in the crossword world as like one of its superstars, and he's doing like so much cool progressive shit in the puzzle mm -hmm. over there. Like USA Today, like he includes as many just you know, there's like a lot of representation of tons of different people in the puzzle. It's mm. not just like. Uh, you know, a lot of the times these puzzles are pitched towards older white men by older white men. And Eric wow. is really like doing cool stuff against that. And it's just a boom for word puzzles, like with the spelling bee game at the New York Times and Wordle. Now the New York Times is buying all of it up. But there's also yeah. like a super <laughs> cool indie crossword scene that you can get as deep into as you want. There's a there's um, queer crosswords. There's um, something called the incubator that's all puzzles written by women, uh, cis women, mm. trans women, women aligned constructors. So yeah, mm. there's just a ton, a ton of cool shit out there. It's a whole scene. Wow. I had no idea. Is, and, and there's no beef between anybody. There's the beef about there, there, there has been, um, word beef. there's word beef and like okay. Will Shorts, who I know and, um, am friends with and have worked with, um, He's a good guy, and there has been like there was a there was an incident a couple years ago with um, 
like a word that was published in the paper that was not intended to be a racial slur and was clued mm. uh, alternately, but also happened to be that. And it was oh, kind of like, that's why a... does that word need to be in your puzzle? And it came out mm. that like it had been brought to his attention and he kind of ran it anyway. So this is not, I'm not spilling tea or like, you know, right. telling tales out of school. This is amply documented on the internet. But so that kind of stuff is where the controversies come in, like words that shouldn't be in there anymore um, that, that mm. get through. I, and and I wonder uh, the puzzles that have a tendency to be more diverse. And we and when you say more diverse, you mean like some of the words may be like words that would would kind of cater more towards these are words that more Black people would know, or these are words that more Native Americans would know, more kind of in their history. And I wonder when they when they make these changes, do they get pushback? Because you know a lot of their fan base is probably predominantly white, predominantly male, and then they oh, can't yeah. solve it. So I could see the pushback going, well, I don't know those words, those words, I can't, you know, like if I would have to go to the to slang version to find it, you know, the slang.com thesaurus, it's not going to be in my Webster dictionary. Yeah, that's probably people crossing swords over cross words. That's it. <sighs> Uh -huh. cute joke alert. You know, I don't think you ended the previous cute joke alert, so yeah. I will assume it to have still been in effect for that one. <laughs> uh, cross swords, you rascal. Um, uh, I think, Karen, your question is super insightful. And um, I think that there are, I think they do get pushback where, you know, people are like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to relax. I don't want to have to know who a rapper is or like a I black know. athlete or, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, I do think that pushback exists, um, unfortunately. And I think it's great that like, oh, you know, over at USA Today now, they're like, yeah, this is what we're doing with the puzzle. Like we stand by our editor and the editorial choices he's making. And, um, you know, there are all, there's also like a real effort to hire um, constructors, crossword makers who are more diverse. Um, mm, okay, because the, so the, the statistics were pretty dismal um, until pretty recently and they're still not mm. great. I could imagine. I wouldn't even thought about that. Yeah, like you need somebody there to, okay, we got the people that can toss the words, but now we need the people that can actually put them where they make sense in the puzzle to the reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I didn't even think like that has to be somebody's job. It's like, okay, we got this great word now. How how do we phrase it where somebody can figure it out? So right. the now you're working on with the, you're doing the crossword show as the host. What do you do when you have dumb comedians? Like how do you... <laughs> How do you, you know, when they're not getting the clues? Somebody like me, I would probably bomb. Nah. I mean, look, it's, all, we all have had those days where you just like, man, I'm not getting the crosswords today. I, I think I'm, or this is going to take five hours. And I don't know if everybody, <laughs> if the crowd has time for five hours of me Googling stuff on my phone. I just had a conversation with a friend. Do you know Chris Duffy? He has a show called You're the Expert. Um, anyways, he's great. It's a similar, like kind of guests are doing an activity that you put them up to show. And okay. we were talking recently, um, about, he was like, there's five, I, I'm not, I hope I can remember what they are, but he was like, there's like five buckets you can put guests into. And the worst one is doesn't say anything. And the best one is says stuff all the time and isn't pushy about like getting their jokes in, like lets you talk right. and waits for the right moments and, and drops the bangers. But that bottom category, that's real. Like there's no way, it's so funny when comedians are like, cause it's such an extreme thing to be asked to do, to be on stage in front of a crowd, solving a crossword puzzle. It's like almost hostile that I'm asking people to do this. And so I feel like my job as the host is to be like, the puzzle part doesn't matter. We're going to solve it every time. Like you're not going to be set up to fail here. And okay. so when it, when it goes right, comedians feel like they can lean into like, I'm an idiot. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I'm a, like a, I'm a fool. And the crowd, it's such a funny choice, like to play that character and crowds always reward comics who are able to like get themselves in there. Um, because that's what it should be. It's like such an right. improbable thing to be expected to be able to do. But um, yes, the times that it's like not so great is when people are like actually intimidated by it or mm. just don't feel comfortable, which is to some extent and probably a large extent on me. But um, mm. when people clam up and I'll sort of like look over at that side of the stage to invite a comment and people are just like, that's that is when I'm kind of like, all right, <laughs> I guess I'll be 
shouldering a lot of this show. That, that's like the kind of thing you have a recurring nightmare about before the show. You know, it's like, you know, I was on stage and no one would say anything and I was naked, you know? <laughs> yeah, people do do that. And we've been on stage, but, you know, we're going to talk. Well, I'm going to talk. So we, we, we don't never have to worry about anybody staring at each other. And not <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it was what Zach said, like, uh, as the host, uh, like, uh, same thing for me is like, I feel like it's my job to get them to, to do their thing, to put mm -hmm. them in a position to succeed. Yes. So, you know, because we've had live shows before where Karen or Justin or whoever the guest would be like, oh, man, I don't know. I'm feeling nervous. I don't know if we're going to be able to do this. And that's when I'm like, oh, no, we got this. Don't worry about that shit. No, we're going to have fun time. I'm not going to let you fail. The, the, the crowd's going to love you. Then you're going to start loving about five minutes in. I'm going to be like, wow, she's just talking through over everything. And that's that's going to be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I just come through and I'm like, you know what? We're going to talk about me, baby. Uh, go to the next time. Have you had anyone who was too good yet? Where you're like, oh, man, this person's question. solving too much shit. Yeah, oh, like from the solving thing. Yes, we yeah. have had people who are like really regular crossword solvers and will like mm. voice objections to my cluing conventions or will be like. <laughs> I object. I, that's not like that's that doesn't match. That wouldn't pass editorial. I actually really try to oh, play no. by the crossword rules and like run clues by people for like a, this is all on point. Right. Um, but I have been called out on stage and I've also been like, yeah, you know, it's like um, I've had times when people were too about the gameplay and I'm trying to do yeah. the comedy piece and like give them opportunities to riff and banter. And they're like looking at the next word and being like, oh, oh, 12 across is ascent. And I'm yeah. like, okay, but wait, 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 wait. No, hold on. We're no, not there yet. We haven't got there yet. There's like, oh, uh, 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 uh can I buy a vow? R wrong gang, wrong gang. Like we're revealing yeah. the rap one <laughs> bar at a time. Yes. What are you doing? Totally. Like, but yeah, all that stuff, with, you know, sound it. It, it's so funny like to see I love live performance because people just show who they are when they're being yeah. asked to perform, but they're not doing their act. And yeah. so like, it's really funny to watch people who can control the them that they are like do that. And then it's also really funny to watch people who are a little bit not in control of it. So again, I really feel like the only time it's a problem is when people just close the tap and right. don't give anything. But as long as you're doing something, it's going to be something to work with. Yeah, it's a competitive uh, competitiveness can take over sometimes for people yeah. too. And yes, maybe, that's right. I, I can see that too. Yeah, and and not yeah. wanting to and like wanting to show that you're smart and good and you can. Uh, do yeah, I have that in me. Mm -hmm. But like, so even if I. I won't, I wouldn't fuck up a show to do it. Like, I wouldn't be like, uh, seven across is a sin. But I would. <laughs> When you got to seven across and you were like, it's a sin, I'd be like, I knew that five minutes ago, but you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to fuck up the little show. <laughs> <laughs> Which everybody would love it. <laughs> Have you had anyone get angry on stage, like flat out just enraged because they got it wrong or they missed it or something like that? Mm, um, I have had people get uh frustrated with themselves for not being able to solve better like i said mm -hmm. i have been called out a couple times and i have to fight my own like rod you were just saying like i have to fight my own desire to be like no actually this is a good clue like it does work right. according to yeah. the rules of how clues have to work it's not my job to i have to just be like the customer is always right the guest yeah. needs to be uh. I have to roll with it. So, you know, that's a little bit of a thing. And then I did have, I've had one solver ever who I thought was like kind of hostile. Like mm -hmm. they were calling me out a lot for jokes that I was making and oh. sort of being like, oh, look at that, yeah. you know, whatever. So that that was like an interesting thing to, to tangle with. I wonder what would be better. I wonder what happened if someone got like really enraged, but with themselves. You know, mm. like after everyone are just like, you fucking idiot. God, idiot. You should have known it. it. Right. You know? <laughs> Everyone's right. looking at you now. No. <laughs> That's when I go into therapist mode and start reminding them how brave they are for even saying yes to the show invitation. Um, did the pandemic change any of your plans with like live shows and mm. touring and all that stuff? Um, did you have to put anything on hold or is it just all the time is working out? The world, the world is opening back up and, and it's time to get out there. 
for a show that um, perhaps one day will take a different recorded form, but for now is 100% a live show. Um, yeah, the pandemic was a was a bit of a kick in the pants. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we pivoted and made like, uh, I think, close to 20 like little bite-sized bits of crossword show branded content that are, we called them solos um, because mm -hmm. they stand on their own. And also we were all alone in our houses and also solos is a palindrome spelled the same forwards and backwards, but um, it, sorry, I don't mean to perform at you on your podcast. No, no, listen, um, you're a word nerd and that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't, don't fight. Right. Don't, fight don't hide my light. You brought me yeah. on knowing full well, mm -hmm. Come um, on. lean into it. So we made some solos. That was great. Um, and I spent the pandemic like writing for Epic Rap Battles um, to keep, you know, to keep myself solvent and uh, working on a show. Um, and so the show that I wrote during the pandemic is in part about the experience of writing a show and not knowing when or really even if you're gonna get to perform it. Um, and so that's what I'm touring in July. We'll be on the East Coast for a bunch of dates and that's the show about like just the very fact that we're here watching a show means like things improved at least enough to the point that we could go out to a theater, even if right. it keeps going up and down for how comfortable we are with that. And yeah. that's been wild too. I've done some shows back and um, it's just weird to perform. I mean, it's just weird. It's not, it's, yeah. it's different e than it was. Everything's weird now. Everything. Yes. Cause like the other thing you can't take away from the pandemic is just the knowledge of what it's like to live in a pandemic right and so uh even things you used to take for granted your brain is now like aligned to at least notice them so i remember watching tv shows and be and it could mm -hmm. be filmed before the pandemic and i would forget for a second and i'd be like oh god they're just really gonna kiss uh, you know, oh yeah yeah because Two two years ago, we didn't even know that was dangerous. We didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't even That's know there right. was like a, a thing that could happen between two strangers meeting and kissing. Now we're like, uh, where everyone, where's your mask? You know, you go to the store now and you're like, uh, a month ago, everyone had a mask. Um, today I have a mask, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just stuff to get used to. And there's still a lot of ways to be safe and do stuff. But it I is. think uh, different places just have to pay attention, like, uh, you know, the masks seem to be a pretty effective thing. Uh, shout out to uh, the N95s out there. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, like the masks seem to be effective. When we did our live show last year, um, uh, no, two years ago, right? Because it's before vaccines that we no, did our- No, we did it last year. Okay, so it was last mm -hmm. year. So we did our live show last year and all the backstage people, everyone had to be masked up. Mm -hmm you know the audience was masked up they were social distance and all that stuff so there's ways to do stuff um it's just how do you want to do it and i think uh when you have a smart fan base which i would imagine crossword the crossword show you have to there's not gonna be too many dumb people that like it mm -mm. They're, they're, mm -hmm, yeah spelling. They're, they're aware and paying attention to stuff like this so a lot of times like when we didn't even have a mask mandate when we did ours, I don't believe, but we knew our audience would wear masks and social yes. distance. And so we, we did, so like um, when we sold the tickets, we like we were telling the venue, like, listen, y'all gonna sell a lot of virtual tickets, a whole lot right? of virtual, and tickets. then the people that do show up are probably gonna need to spread out. They're not gonna want to be all up on each other. Mm -hmm. And as long as y'all are cool with that, then we'll do the show. Oh, and they were fine with that. So it's definitely possible. Do y'all sell like a virtual thing too for people to watch it online or is it just all in person for now? Man, even you asking me that makes me feel like, God, we really should have figured out how to do it virtually. But mm -hmm. I think for our show's format, I just never felt like mm -hmm. it just, I never felt like it was going to translate. And I was like, we're just going to wait. Um, so yeah. Um, no, we don't have a virtual version of the show and we didn't tape them and make them available. We just decided, let's just wait till we can do it the way it's supposed to be done. Okay. I'm actually writing a show now that I think will be much more like, it could potentially be consumable as a virtual thing, but the ones that I've written are like, I don't know, it's just, mm -hmm. you gotta be there. Yeah, it's also like uh, a cost and time to that part too. Cause it's like another muscle you have to have to be like, all right, so how are we gonna film this? Is someone gonna have, a camera on me it's gonna be uh, multiple cameras is yes like yeah, it is a yeah with ours it was multiple yeah it's a big like three thing. or four cameras and like 
it's a whole crew and like this is their thing their whole thing is to record everything and i know that is extra but i think a lot of money is, is left on the table for a lot of people mm. when they don't do that and i think more venues are starting to offer it because they go well no matter what we do, you're going to have some people going, I'm not never going out to nowhere. Right. I mean, public again, honestly, so. the best thing about the pandemic, right. is, if there has to be a best thing, is definitely the use of technology to connect people. Yeah. Like, even just doing this. Has forced like, a lot of people to step their There were a lot up. of comedians we couldn't even have on the show before because they'd be like, I don't have a laptop or I, can I do this through a Casio keyboard? And you're like, no. what? No. <laughs> no. Like, but now it's like Zoom happened, and now everyone has the ability to to just get on their webcam. Um, before we get out of here, I do want to ask you, um, and, and I definitely want you to plug the crossword show and where everybody can go to get tickets and stuff. But mm -hmm. um, can you tell everybody about the new word craze? I was listening to you on Dork Forest, and uh, there's a, a new type of word that you're really interested in. Um, can you, can you tell everybody what, what it is? Yes. And your research game is strong. I just did Dork <laughs> Forest. Like, that's very fresh. It came out today, actually. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, yeah. So on Dork Forest, I talked about words and um, wordplay and specifically this very, very um, kind of boutique kind of wordplay called. Uh, so the name for this kind of word is super vocalics. So in the wordplay world, vocalic means related to vowels. And a super vocalic word is one, so the conditions are really specific, but I'll give you a ton of examples. It contains all five of the vowels, but only one time each. So it has to have one A, one E, one I, one O, and one U. So a really good example that actually came to my attention today is the movie title Top Gun Maverick. There's an O in mm -hmm. top, a U in gun, an A in E and an I in maverick. And there's only one of them. Mm -hmm. So so they're kind of rare. And then there's another, there's like a sub variant that has a Y in it. Um, but so some other examples of super vocalics besides Top Gun Maverick are like um, Austin Powers is a good example. Um, on Dork Forest, I talked about the rapper Ski Mask, the Slump God. Um, he is a, he has a, a super vocalic name. Um, and the word super vocalic, it's not an accident, but it is itself super vocalic. It has one of each of the vowels uh, in its name. So um, here's I've, what's going to blow everyone's mind right now. Yeah. I didn't notice till just now, but I think the black guy who tips is super vocalic. Let me tell you something, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> it is? It is <laughs> not. It is super vocalic. And it's almost, it's almost, oh, the Y. Oh. The Y doesn't ruin anything. The, so the name for but Super That's the next level. That's the next level, yep. But there's a thing called a perfect five um, where mm. it's five words and each one has one of the vowels and it's so close to a perfect five. Mm. It's not, but it is absolutely super vocalic. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, I didn't even realize it till literally I, I just typed it on my word thing to be like, wait a minute. I think I resemble this. That's <laughs> amazing. Boom. That is and too I, I got perfect. a new vocabulary word because I'm not going to lie. I've never heard of nobody super vocalic. Yeah, That's it's pretty how... obscure. It's pretty well, obscure. Listen, Karen, Karen loves nothing more than to say what she don't know. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> thing, I, want, I want people to know. I don't big... know. Don't have any high expectations. <laughs> I don't know it. She's, that's a big thing for her. That's her dork. That's her dork though. <laughs> yeah. uh, tell everybody where to go to get tickets and how to see you. Yeah, for sure. So the crossword show, we tour a lot on the West Coast, but we're coming back to the East Coast for the first time since March 2020. Don't know if you remember it. Oh, um, what happened then? Uh, but um, yes, <laughs> it will be. We're doing eight shows. Uh, on the East Coast in July um, in New England, like some random parts of New England to tune up. And then we're going to be in Boston. We're going to be in New York City for two shows at Caveat um, in Manhattan, an amazing venue. And then we'll be in DC. Um, so if you're in New England or any of those major Eastern seaboard type cities, the Crossword Show has rap, comedy, wordplay, trivia, and hosting, which are my like personal comedy 
you know, the, the parts where I've inhabited entertainment. So it's kind of like the Venn diagram of all those things. And I love it so much. And um, yeah, I hope people see it. Where can they find you online? Like your that's Twitter, that's a really Instagram. important piece. Clearly, marketing <laughs> is not one of my entertainment <laughs> superpowers. <laughs> um, all of our ticket links are up at crosswordshow.com. Or as a joke that I sometimes make in the show when we put up a slide with our URL, I say, check out our website, crosswordshow.com. <laughs> so but yeah, crosswordshow.com is the uh, is where it's all at. Uh, so make sure you check them out. And then also on social media, Zach Sherwin, everywhere that you get your social media. Uh, Zach, it was so great to virtually this meet you fun. and have you on the show and stuff. Thank you so much for having me. It's so interesting to talk to you. You're both sm so smart and so warm and so interested. And I, Rod, I can't, what a perfect ending to see the super vocalic in the black guy who tips. Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> I'm going to share it with the super vocalic nerd community. It's yeah. too good. <laughs> That is, that is like some serendipity there. All right, y'all. That's it for us. Tomorrow we'll be back. We have uh, our friend Nick Jew uh, mm -hmm. from uh, What's the Tea Podcast. So we'll be hanging Yay. out with her. And I can't wait to have you on again. We'll play games next time. That should be fun. There you go. And until next time, I love you. I love you too. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye, -bye. Zach. Bye -bye. Have a good Thank one. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye, everybody. Bye.